will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make a boast in him, and the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Truly, we serve a God who is worthy of our praises, not just some of the time, but all of the time. And I believe that everybody that is viewing uh, this recording today will agree with me when I say that in spite of it all, God has still been good to us and he's still being good to us. I'm grateful today to have another opportunity to come to you and share a word afresh with you from the Holy Writ. I hope that this message will bless you as much or even more than it has blessed me. And I truly hope that it will grant you some spiritual refreshment as well as some encouragement in these challenging and testing times that we are living in at the present. Our message today will come from the prophetic book of Jeremiah, chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. It reads as thus, beginning at the first verse. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. The title of this message today is The Clay That Is in the Potter's Hand. The setting in the saga of this narrative is in the year of 730 BC. At this particular time, Jerusalem is the epic center of the promised land that the Lord had promised to the children of Israel through the vocal cords of Moses before they were relieved to come out of Egypt. When they came out of Egypt, the Lord had promised them that he would take care of them. But he also told them that he would continue to provide for them and take care of them if they would abide by his word and his will. The Lord kept his part of the bargain because faithful is he who has called you and he will do it. The prophet Isaiah says that the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. But history records that when the children of Israel came into the promised land, after some length of time, they began to show signs of forgetting what God had told them to do. In other words, they started to act as though they had forgotten their part of the covenant. And that was to walk and to live according to the will and the word of God every day of their lives. But history also records that the children of Israel began to lust after an idol God by the name of Baal. Baal was an idol God that represented all the materialistic things of this world. And the children of Israel was displaying an attitude that clearly showed that they were not completely satisfied with what God had blessed them with. When people are not completely satisfied with the blessings of God, more often than not, they will seek out other means to fulfill this superficial void that they have uh, determined to be within their lives. And the dangerous thing about this is that you can put nothing that can replace God. And whatever the world has to offer you, and that's all Baal worship had to offer them, was the amenities of this world. 
and all the amenities of this world are at best temporary. The Apostle Peter alludes to this in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, for he says that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the element will burn with fervent heat, and the earth and everything therein shall be burned up. Seeing that all of these things shall be dissolved, what manner of people we ought to be in all holy conversation and godliness. <clears throat> so it is imperative that we live up to the will and the word of God, not some of the time, but all of the time. Now God could have cut the children of Israel off, but he did not. And the reason why he did not is because he's a long-suffering God. He is a patient God. He tends to watch over us and keep us even when we do not deserve it. So as we look at the children of Israel in this text and at this particular time, they had gotten themselves into a quiet mire. By their bad behavior, they had separated themselves from the Lord. But because God is a compassionate God, the Lord decided to send a prophet, preacher, teacher by the name of Jeremiah to give them a timely word. Jeremiah was to give them a word of warning. He was to give them a word of reconciliation. And he was to let them know that if they would change their ways, that God would not severely chastise them like he would if they continued on the path that they was on. So the Lord tagged Jeremiah and told him to go down to the potter's house. Now notice, if you will, the text says that the Lord, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and it informed Jeremiah or directed Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house. You see, geographically speaking, Jerusalem was the highest location in that, in that area. And it was made like that so that everybody in that area, in that location, could look up to Jerusalem and they could see Jerusalem being nothing less than a beacon of the almighty and holy God. And this is what the Lord wants all of us as 21st century Christians to be, many Jerusalems. So when people look at us, they can see the light of the glory of God. Jesus alludes to this when he says that we are to let our light so shine that men may see our good works and then glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Yes, the children of Israel had turned their backs on God, but God still had not turned his back on them. He tells Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house. And when Jeremiah gets down to the potter's house, to his chagrin, he finds the potter is at work. The potter is at work on the wheels. The first thing that the prophet Jeremiah understands here is that this person that is working on the wheels is a potter. Now, what is the significant thing about that? The Hebrew word for potter is the word yaksar. And the Hebrew word yaksar in his primitive etymology carried with it the idea of someone who is a professional, someone who is extremely good at his craft, of taking clay and shaping it into a useful vessel. And this is what Jeremiah saw when he went down to the potter's house. He saw an individual who knew exactly what he was doing. He saw an individual who was indeed a potter in every sense of the word. The potter in this text, in this narrative, represents God. We serve a God who is omniscient, He's omnipresent, and he's all-powerful. This God knows what he is doing all of the time. And this God is a wonderful potter. He knows how to transcend or transfer, if you will, what, he, what his mental design is for all of us through his hands and to us. And if we yield 
to the hands of the potter. The potter can also make us into a useful vessel. Also, Jeremiah said that he was working on the wheels. Now this apparatus that the potter was using was two wheels, two wheels that was connected by a wooden shaft. And the lower wheel, the potter would turn the lower wheel with his foot and he would put the clay on the top wheel. And while the wheels are spinning, he would shape this amorphous body of clay into a useful vessel. Notice I said, these are two wheels. <laughs> the wheels turning round and round represent circumstances because in this world that we live in, there is no day just like the day we just had. <laughs> no, long, no matter how long we live in this world, we will never experience the same day that we had before. And that's what these wheels represent. It represents the circumstances that come with the changes of time. You know, circumstances, good days and bad days, sunny days and stormy days, days that we are up on top of the mountain, days that we are down in the valley, days that we are healed, days that we are sick. Those are circumstances. And the potter uses those circumstances in order to fashion and form the clay into a useful vessel. And so when we feel the pressure of the hands of the potter on us, and he's trying to form us into what he wants to form us in, what we need to do is yield to the potter's hand. When the potter is shaping us and forming us into what he desires us to be, it will not always line up with what we think we ought to be. And that's when we need to check ourselves, especially when things are going helter-skelter in our lives, especially when things seem to be going awry in our lives. We need to go back and check the mirror and make sure that the person we see in the mirror has the right relationship with God and that person is being obedient to the will and the word of God. Now, when we are obedient to the will and the word of God, those hands will be successful in shaping us into what God desires us to be. Not what we want to be, but what God, what God desires us to be. Solomon said it best when he said, except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city the watchman work his butt in vain. Secondly, the second point I want to drive home here is that we need to learn how to appreciate the toleration of the potter. Notice the text says that while Jeremiah was watching the potter work with the clay on the wheels, that all of a sudden the potter sensed or he felt a flaw in the in the in the in the clay in other words it became marred in the potter's hand now notice the text says vessel since this had become formulated into a vessel it indicates to us that the potter had spent some time some energy working on this piece of clay to at least get it to the form of being a vessel and then when it formed into a vessel, it found out that it had a flaw in it. It was marred. But look at the toleration of the potter. The potter did not discard this uh, vessel that had become marred in his hand. He didn't throw it away. He left it on top of the table. And that's the way God does us. When we become marred in life, when we make a mistake in life, we make a misstep in life when we do something we should not do. God does not turn away from us and abandon us all at once. He will give us some time to get it straight. When God decides to squish the vessel, he does not give the vessel any warning. He does not give it a prior alert. 
He doesn't give it any kind of sign that he's about to squish it. He just abruptly brings his hand down and squish it. God is a God who is able to stop whatever we're doing whenever he wants to do it. He can stop our clubbing. He can stop our carousing. He can stop us doing from doing stuff that we should not do anytime he wants to do it. And please don't confuse God's grace with that he is letting you get by. No, 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 no. God gives us grace in order to give us an opportunity to get some things straight in our lives. Many of us, like this potter, would have had a different discernation, a different resolution for this. Because if we had spent as much time with this vessel as the potter had spent with it, many of us would have desired, would have determined to discard it or throw it away. But we serve a God who does not want to discard us, neither does he want to throw us away, but he wants to deliver us. And this is what this potter did. This potter pushed this clay down flat on top of the table. And then when he did that, he, get, he began another process that we call kneading. Kneading is a process where a colonician will begin to kneel the dough, to kneel it out, to flatten it out. And sometimes God has to do us like that to get the mud out of our lives. It was the mud that created the more problem in the vessel. Because you see, when the mud is mixed with the clay, it's hard to tell the difference between the clay and the mud. But what separates the clay and the mud is their reaction to the circumstances of this life. When the wheel began to turn, the clay would yield to the hands of the potter. But as the, as the, as the wheel began to turn, the mud would start to get harder and resist the hands of the potter. Now, the potter cannot mold a vessel into what he wanted to be if it continues to resist him. And so what he has to do is remove the mud from the clay. And he does this by kneading. And sometimes God has to knead us. He has to flatten us down, knead the lying out of us, knead the backbiting out of us, knead hatred out of us, knead unforgiveness out of us. You get the picture. And once he gets through kneading us, and the next thing that he does, he takes another instrument called a mallet. It's a wooden mallet. It's a big hammer, if you will. And everywhere he sees a bubble on in this clay, he hits that bubble. That bubble represents pride. It represents haughtiness. It represents high-mindedness. And the Lord cannot use us until we come, come before his presence in a humble fashion. If we humble ourselves in the presence of God, in due time, he will lift us up. And when we humble ourselves, we can love one another like we should love one another. We can serve God like we should serve God. And we can be a better person all around in our lives when we humble ourselves. The last step here is the step of restoration. Notice what the potter does after he has finished kneeling this clay. The next thing the potter does, he takes his foot and he starts spinning the wheel again. And this clay that was marred, this clay that many of us would be ready to throw away, God takes this clay and begins to form it again as he spins the wheel around. And he forms it and fashions it into what he wants it to be. And this time is successful because there is no clay, there is no mud in the clay to prevent the potter's hand from transform, transferring out of his mind and through his hands to what he wants the vessel to be. I heard a songwriter say not long ago, have thine way, Lord, have thine way. <laughs> you are the potter and I am the clay. Make me and mold me and shape me into what you want me to be. Ephesians 2 and 10 says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto 
good works. God created us to do good works. I'd like to close on a song lyric that I've heard not long ago. It says, amazing grace shall always be my song of praise. I do know, I don't know why he came to love me so, but he looked beyond my faults and he saw my needs. I just got a click from the Holy Ghost and hold up there. Dr. Wigginsworth says that any man can count the number of seeds that is in an apple, but it takes God, only God can count the number of apples that's in one seed. Oh, he looked beyond my faults and he saw my needs. I'm sure I got some company out there today that's looking at me and can testify and say, no, I haven't always been like I am now. No, I haven't always had the relationship that I have with God now, but I'm so glad that he had patience with me, that he kept me on the wheel and he looked beyond my faults Hallelujah. And he saw all of my needs. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, hey, hey, but now I'm found. I was blind, but right now I see. God bless you. Have a beautiful day the rest of the day. And don't forget to give God the praise he deserves.